co-founder. I am the uh, the VP of events, which programming. And this is, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Civility Project. I've talked with them starting last year, late last year. We were talking about, um, you know, the political scene and, and how we're going to navigate that world of, you know, the election talk and, and how do we have a civil discussion from you know, people who, who have different backgrounds of life and, and, and political party views and maybe not political party views. It's, um, and, and now we're in a, a total different situation where we have a number of things that we're, we're up against and the talking points have become so, uh, so much greater than, than what I ever assumed that we'd be doing. Um, so I think the best way to do is just kick this off right to the team. Um, Lynn is, is my, my contact at the Civility Project. Uh, she and I have had great discussions. I'm really looking forward to this and to waste no more time, I'm gonna give it right to her. So Lynn, please take us take this sure. away. Yeah, so I'm Lynn Galadner and I'm really lucky to work with Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. And in a minute, I'm gonna have them introduce um, who they are and the Civility Project. But we wanted to start by asking the participants to put in the chat, which will end up being a chat waterfall. If you've ever experienced that, it's kind of fun. It goes really fast. Um, that what is the most critical thing you're thinking about right now? So what's the biggest issue on your mind? If you would put that in the chat, um, I'd love to see it and we'll record it and then that'll guide our conversation too. So what is the most critical thing that you're thinking about right now? Let's put that in the chat. So anyone want to jump in? The most critical thing that you're thinking about right now that's on your mind that's uh, concerning to you. Okay, how can I help make things better? You entered three, three. Oh, we'll mute that. So yeah, I'm going to ask everyone to mute themselves too so that um, we can hear the, the speakers. So if you want to put in the chat what is on your mind, what is worrying you, um, what is the critical things that you're worried about at this moment, we will address that. So while we're waiting for that, Nolan and Stephen, why don't you guys jump in, introduce yourselves and the Civility Project, please. Well, I'm Nolan Finley. I'm the editorial page editor of the Detroit News. Uh, been at the Detroit News for 44 years, been editorial page editor for 20 years, and have known Steve Henderson for about a dozen years or more. And he and I sort of got thrown together because of our jobs. Uh, when I first met Steve, he was editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press, uh, the liberal al uh, alternative to our conservative views. And you know, people uh, thought when, when, when he first came on that wouldn't it be fun to throw the two of them into a bucket like a couple of crayfish and watch them fight? And it became sort of a marketing gimmick, if you will. You marketers will understand. It made for good television, but uh, what made, I think, for better television is we were able to get in that bucket without tearing each other's claws off and, and killing one another. We were, you know, I think very quickly learned uh, that we could deliver our messages better if we learned to uh, have civil conversations with one another and it took a bit and a lot a lot went into that i'll let steve talk about that yeah no it did um uh you know i, I consider nolan uh one of my closest friends um uh and um that is against every odd you would you might imagine <laughs> um uh, as he said you know, we come from really different backgrounds, uh, but also come at the world from really different places and perspectives. And mm -hmm. uh, when we were first, um, when we were first trying to figure out whether we could work together, um, you know, I think a lot of people figured, A, it wouldn't work, or if it did, it would just devolve into this kind of uh, shouting match, uh, the kind of thing you see on cable television where there's, black guy and a white guy or a liberal guy and a conservative guy, all they do is shout at each other. Um, but, you know, over, over the years, I think what we've found is that um, uh, 
uh, that there's more to both of us than than either of those caricatures, and that um, uh, that it was worth getting to know on both of our sides uh, who that other person was beyond these politics or, or points of view. Um, and it, it's taken it's taken that 12 years, I think, to get to the space where we are now. Um, uh, and there were lots of lots of uh, efforts on our part, intentional mm -hmm. efforts, uh, to be able to, to, to build that relationship in a way that, that, that goes beyond um, uh, the, the sort of stereotype um, that, that, that you see in lots of places. One of the things that we did that I thought was really interesting and important to, to, to thinking about that relationship and thinking about what makes it work and trying to share it with others uh, is uh, a couple of years back, StoryCorps, which is a, an NPR project, um, came to Detroit uh, and they, they had like an open invitation. They said, pick somebody important uh, in your life, uh, come down here and record your story with that person for an hour. Uh, and so all kinds of people brought their spouses or their children or their parents. Uh, well, I brought Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Look, I want to, I want to uh, go do this. And I, what I want us to talk about is why we think the things we do. I don't want to talk about the things we either agree or disagree about. I want to talk about where it all comes from. I want to talk about why I consider myself uh, a liberal or a progressive or whatever label I might want to affix to my chest. Uh, I want to hear how you came to call yourself a conservative. What, what were the things that happened in your life um, that brought you to this point? Uh, and the reason I wanted to do that was because I thought uh, at that point, you know, we'd been friends for a number of years already. I thought, uh, it was, it, it's kind of worth exploring how we got beyond the simplicity of who we were. Uh, it, it's worth uh, trying to, 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 to really map out um, what more there is in this relationship than, than disagreement. Um, and, and one way to do that is to, is to know more about each other in that way uh, and to have a conversation about um, you know, who we are and why we are, uh, as opposed to uh, why we disagree. Uh, I mean, we could spend all day talking about the things that we disagree <laughs> with. Uh, we could shout at each other and we'd get really upset. Um, uh, and sometimes we do that. I mean, sometimes we do it on TV. <laughs> um, but, uh, but more important, I think, is that we are able to um, to relate to each other and respect each other uh, because we know more about where it all comes from than most people do with each other. I mean, if you think about people that you, that you disagree with, uh, people who you think are different from you, how much do you really know about why they think that? How much do you really know about what, what experiences brought them uh, to, to that point? And so, uh, we went down and, and literally sat in a, in a, I don't know, 10 by 10 Winnebago for an hour, uh, <laughs> talked about, talked about how, how we got to the, the point where we were. Um, and I think that was a real turning point for us in, in terms of saying, well, if we can do this, what value could that have for other people? Uh, what, what kind of uh, advancement for other people's relationships? Could this, this exercise uh, offer and that was really the, the the beginning of the idea of this civility project that that we've been working on for a couple of years is is encouraging everybody else uh, to try that and to try to take that on with people they know uh, as a way of of redirecting the conversation uh, away from disagreement and towards some sort of uh, some sort of understanding and you know, most people don't understand why others don't think the same way they do, why they don't vote the same, why they're not a member of the same political party. They don't understand the why of that. Uh, and so they assign negative attributes to those 
who are negative reasons for the disagreement. You don't vote the way I do because you want to destroy the country or you're evil or you're stupid. And, you know, what we've come to understand is that most people, not all, but most people approach life, approach issues the same way, uh, you know, with a good faith, good faith effort to examine the facts, get the information, then they apply their own values and experience to it. And that's where the, the differences come, the disagreements come. And once you understand what those values are that someone is applying to their opinion making, their, to their, to their decision making, uh, it's a little less hard to, uh, to assign negative attributes uh, uh, to those person, people. I mean, you understand, you know, they're just different from you. They're, they were raised different. They've had different experiences. Steve talked about our, our story core experience in the Winnebago. Uh, I like to tell the story of what he and I, you know, we both, uh, one of the things that we do agree on, we both love bourbon. And he and I were sharing a bourbon at a Republican state convention a few years ago or early on in our relationship. Uh, and of course, that was a very uncomfortable place for him to be. But, you know, we're in a bar sharing a bourbon and these two women come up um, who I knew and they said they, they had noticed us drinking together. And they said, oh, gosh, how could you how could you uh, be around that Stephen Henderson? He, we just hate him, blah, blah. I said, you hate him? I said, do you know him? No, no, we've never talked to him. I said, I'll tell you what, why don't you go over there and talk to him for a little bit? It was two hours later, I'm pulling them off of him. I mean, they were, and they said, oh, my gosh, he's just so great. You know, they took the time to get to know him for something other than his political writings. You know, they took, good, took the time to know him as a person, and they found out, hey, he's pretty cool. And I think over and over again, we've seen people come to that uh, place when they take the time to talk rather than argue, and uh, when, when they take the time to understand people rather than make assumptions about people. So before we move ahead, um, and I will tell everybody that we're going to get into some Q&A, which will be at least half the program. Um, mm -hmm. And I already am seeing some great questions, so please put them in the chat and I'll make sure to, to get them in the order we receive them. I just want to mention really quickly, Stephen, if you could just tell people um, what your role is now. So Nolan's at the Detroit News. You are host of Detroit Today on WDET and maybe just mention Bridge really quickly. Yeah, so uh, I, I host a daily uh, talk show on the public radio station here in, in Detroit. I uh, host uh, American Black Journal as well, which is a Detroit public television show here uh, in the city. And Nolan and I are both uh, co-hosts of a, of a uh, show called One Detroit on Detroit Public Television. Uh, but I also just uh, helped launch a uh, Detroit-focused news and engagement uh, organization called uh, called Bridge Detroit, um, which is uh, a um, will be a daily uh, uh, news and engagement uh, organization here in the city, really focused on Detroiters, Detroiters' voices, Detroiters themselves. Uh, it is staffed by Detroiters uh, and reflective of the city's majority African American and Latino uh, population, which is key uh, uh, as a news organization. Um, but we just we just got started with that, and it's actually a pretty exciting uh, development and experience. Thank you, Stephen. And so Lynn, Lynn, just a second. We I think we need to add just a minute uh, on what the Civility Project is, and you know how it works. Uh, what we do in normal times, uh, before we were all sort of limited in our interactions to Zoom and Skype and what have you, is we actually put people together. We ask organizations like yours to pair people of different viewpoints, whether it's on politics or culture or whatever it is, pair people of different viewpoints uh, in a non-threatening setting uh, to talk about their backgrounds, their experiences, why they think certain ways, what motivates uh, their, their uh, opinions, and do the, exactly what Steve and I did at StoryCorps, and then we bring them together as a whole group to talk about what they've learned and whether it's sort of changed their opinion of the people they're, they're talking, uh, talking to. 
Thank you. Yeah, we're going to, um, in this talk, we'll talk a little bit about how you can build civility and um, some easy steps that we can take. <clears throat> I know we want to talk a little bit about some of the big issues that are pressing right now. And one question that came in um, already is about how, you know, one-on-one -on -one is great. And it's probably a lot easier when you're just one-on-one -on -one with someone, even if they're different from you, to explore these things and have these conversations. And I think that's a good question to launch us into sort of some of the current issues that we're facing, which is that, you know, we're seeing um, a huge blow up regarding race relations across the country. Um, we have an election coming up. The politics are just still rampant. And of course, the backdrop is this pandemic, um, which also is you know, rife with uh, different opinions and um, opposition. And so those seem to be not just one-on-one, -on -one, but like community to community, group to group, especially with the protests that we're seeing. So I wonder if you guys could take a few minutes to touch on these big challenging community-based uh, issues that we're facing right now, and where does civility come into that? Dave? Yeah, well, um, I've actually, I mean, I've actually had a lot of time to think about that in the last couple of days, especially, um, you know, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with what's happening here in Detroit, um, uh, there have been massive protests every day since, I think, uh, uh, Friday um, uh, in the downtown area. Um, they have uh, started out as uh, really organized uh, demonstrations about uh, police brutality and systemic racism. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, these are tumultuous and confusing times. And uh, each night uh, as the protests go on, I think they kind of morph into all kinds of uh, other things. Um, uh, so so it's, a, it's a tough time. Also, you know, uh, I'm an African-American man who, who lives in Detroit, who lives in this country, uh, who's raising uh, uh, children uh, in this city and in this country, uh, and frankly, who is um, both absolutely exasperated and fed up uh, but also uh, quite fearful. Uh, I am really fearful uh, for the experiences that, uh, that my kids uh, might have uh, in the world now and in the future. Um, and, and that fear is based not only on what's going on now, but, um, but what's been going on for a long time and the things that I've experienced. Uh, you know, uh, um, this is a country where the fundamental inequalities that exist uh, among us uh, have been around since the beginning. Um, and there's no person today who's not experiencing that. Um, and so I, I have, uh, on the radio show I host, I, I was talking the other morning about the, the flood of different emotions that I think a lot of people are feeling right now, uh, including myself, you know, and I, I just kind of took a moment to say, uh, give yourself some space. It's okay. It's okay to feel all of these things. It's and it's especially okay to be confused uh, about some of it. Um, you know, is it okay uh, for people to express this frustration through violence? I think that's a super complicated question um, and does not have an easy answer. Um, but it's okay to say, I don't know. I want to think about that. I want to wait until I have something to say uh, that, that makes sense and that I've thought through. It's okay to say, I don't really understand how systematic inequality or racism works. And so I'm having a hard time understanding what's going on and how people are feeling. Um, uh, I think we have to be able to give ourselves that space uh, because this is, this is tough stuff. It is important stuff uh, and it is gonna change um, it is going to change the trajectory of a number of different conversations in our country for a really long time. The other thing um, I, I think is really important right now, and this gets specifically to the civility uh, question that we're talking about here. Um, at once, I feel both like civility has never been more important than it is right now. It has never been more important for someone like me to be able to say to someone like Nolan, what is 
happening uh, and, and what effect it has on me and how important it is. It has never been more important for me to have to convince Nolan and other people in white America uh, of the importance of this and what they should be doing uh, to combat systematic inequality. Uh, but I also at the same time feel like um, I can't do that right now. I mean, I literally feel like I cannot have that conversation uh, at this moment um, because I, I can't, I can't make heads or tails of too much of it. And, uh, and I want to, I, I need time to, to process all this both emotionally and intellectually. And, and that is an equally important part of civility, knowing when you cannot engage in the conversation that you know you need to and stepping away from it. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not going to talk to Nolan. It doesn't mean Nolan's not my friend. Uh, and I'm not picking on Nolan here. I'm just using, uh, you know, the, the, the construct. I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, the construct of this conversation. Um, but, you know, importantly, walking away now, for me, says that's what I need to do right this second. But I'm now walking away from the overall conversation and I'm not walking away from the relationship. Uh, I'm not saying this is a reason we can't have this conversation. I'm saying it's a reason we might not be able to have this conversation right now. Uh, and I think that's okay. Uh, I think that's a really important concept to get your arms around that, that uh, civility in some cases is about saying, let's take a break. Uh, uh, I don't see, how this could be a productive conversation at this point because of the way that I feel, not because of something you're doing. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so I haven't been having a lot of debate about this. I haven't been having, I mean, I, I've been uh, trying to, to, to host the, the, the forums where people get to talk about this on the radio show and other places, uh, but, but I'm absenting myself uh, from some of it because, because I value civility, which is kind of an ironic uh, uh, dynamic. And it's, and it's probably very raw for you at this moment. And so, uh, you know, your ability to uh, get, be, get beyond things that are said inadvertently, that are hurt from what have you, probably less so than normal. But I do think there's got to become a time here uh, when we have to have civil conversations about what's happening out there. We have to sort of get beyond the emotions and, and start talking to each other because we have some serious challenges to solve as a nation. And if we don't learn to talk honestly with each other, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, we're not gonna get beyond that. We're not going to solve these challenges. One of the things I worry about what's happening this week is the sort of easy, you know, the compartmentalization of this, the narrow focus on police brutality. And I think that's, that's a much bigger issue and a much harder conversation. Uh, you could solve, you could put in every good practice police reform uh, you can get rid of all of the bad cops and you still haven't gotten to what's the, what's really wrong in America today that we need. I mean, if you love the country, you want it, you want to fix it. I'm a patriot. I love the country. I want it to work right. I want it to work right for everyone. And I do think you've got to get to the, the, the racial gaps and everything from education to uh, the workplace, the economic opportunity. I mean, if all we're talking about is, is oh, we got to get rid of the racist cops, we got to stop the police brutality, and if you think that's enough to say, I think you're missing a big point here. We're not going to get where we need. We can't have this conflict raging in our country forever, and we can't have a permanent underclass in our country. Uh, we've got, if, if you if you, you know, if you're someone who, you know, believes in this country and believes in free markets and believes in, in you know, economic uh, progress, 
you got to solve these problems or you can never get to where we want to be. And so, uh, you know, everybody's comfortable talking about police brutality. I'm not sure everybody's so comfortable talking about the other pieces of this. I mean, that's my thoughts, Absolutely. you know, from a conservative perspective. Uh, I, you know. And we have this going on um, at a time when we have this pandemic still happening. Um, yeah. So much um, unrest and inequity in the way the pandemic affected people and communities. Um, and then so much bitterness too about it. I mean, and it's something Steve and I have had passionate disagreements on, uh, on how this should play out. But again, coming from different perspectives uh, and different experiences and the way it's manifested our, itself in, in our lives. And it, you know, it's been, it's, it's been a different experience for the two of us. And then leading up to a presidential election this year mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, civility sort of um, overhangs all of this because without the ability to be civil and to interact and to understand other sides or opposing viewpoints, how do we move forward? And so um, what can people do to, to really help build civility you know, in their relationships, in their communities, in their workplaces? Are there some practical steps that you can offer um, that people well, can start with? Well, I mean, there, there are, and, and we'll get to, first I wanna say though about the political season is for all of us to understand, there are people out there who find great profit and benefit in dividing us. And so you always hear our political leaders, both sides saying, we're all in this together. We wanna to unite America. No, they win by dividing America. And we've seen that, we see it now. Um, again, identifying myself as conservative Republican, um, I'm absolutely horrified at what I've seen from uh, this president whom I consider to be neither conservative nor Republican, but that's another discussion. Uh, we can't respond to those kind of politics any longer. And we've been too responsive to those kind of Republicans. But, you know, I, and, and I'm sure in, in terms of the techniques, um, you know, I, I'll offer some, Steve will offer some, but I think, the, you know, we talked about gaining a mutual respect first. I think that's essential. Uh, listening ra rather than talking, that's one, you know, Steve will talk more about, I've heard him, you know, talk very eloquently about that, but going in with at least a notion that you might not be 100% right, and you might not know everything you need to know about a subject, and maybe you can learn something from a conversation if you converse honestly, that maybe there's something you can learn from the other person, or at least, or find value in a conversation that helps you assess your own views, even if your views don't change. I'm never going to change Steve's views. I gave up converting him a long time ago, but I find the conversation with him to be intensely stimulating and interesting, no matter how heated it gets, because it helps me challenge and, and hone and refine my own views. And, you know, I learned all long a time ago, I'm not right about everything. And I relish that opportunity to learn something. And so if you go in with that spirit, I think you have a chance at a civil conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Nolan touched on this, but but the, 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 the sort of art of listening is super key to, to the idea of civility. And, and when we say listening, I think we mean something maybe a little different than what, uh, what a lot of people think. I think most of us believe that if we're not talking, we're mm -hmm. listening. Um, but but that's actually only half of it. Uh, uh, there is uh, another step you have to take, which is really focusing in on what uh, what the other person is saying and trying to understand what the other person is saying and where they're coming from, and not thinking uh, what am I going to say back? Right. Uh, I think I, I catch myself doing this a lot uh, when when you, when I'm not talking. Uh, I'm just maybe thinking about what's the next thing I'm going to say to this person, uh, as opposed to really focusing in on what they're what they're talking about. Um, it, I, it's an intentional act, and I think um, if you don't um, purposely do it, 
um, it, it is really hard to, to achieve. Um, uh, another really important tenet of, of civility, I think, again, is the idea of not walking away, um, the idea of not walking away permanently, right? Um, uh, always believing that there's another opportunity <clears throat> to have another conversation with with that person uh, where you might learn something where uh, or where you might make progress uh, uh, toward an understanding and agreement. Um, uh, and that's really hard because uh, there are lots of times when you might. We like, we like to say we never go to bed mad. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it also does mean being able to walk away when you need to. Uh, and, and, and doing it respectfully and saying, all right, we can't get any further on this right now. Uh, we got to try again some other time. Um, and, and that's difficult, uh, that's difficult as well. Um, but, but the intentionality, I think, of these things is one of the things that, that's really key. Uh, this doesn't happen organically. Uh, this is hard. And if it isn't hard, if it doesn't feel like it's hard, you're probably not doing it right. Uh, if it's easy, uh, you aren't really achieving the kinds of uh, uh, things I think that we're, tr that we're talking about trying to achieve. Um, uh, because a lot of this goes against uh, our, our kind of instincts in, in terms of the way that we think about uh, a, asserting the things that we believe and defending those beliefs against people uh, who don't believe them. This kind of asks us to rethink the things that we learn uh, automatically and try to do things uh, really differently. And understand and accept that there, we're always gonna have differences. Those differences aren't going to go away. Uh, that's what makes this an interesting, rich play. So, we all don't think alike and we don't have to, but that doesn't mean we can't interact uh, on a civil plane and that we can't come to some sort of consensus. And that's one of the things on a national level, I think now increasingly on a local level, we've lost that ability to give up pieces of uh, the things we want uh, to reach a consensus, uh, you know, compromise, if you will. Uh, it's, it's a lost art. So I'd love to jump into some questions. Um, mm -hmm. It always happens that every, the time goes so quickly. And we have wonderful questions in the chat. And please um, feel free to put more in there. And just so you guys know, we will be starting a monthly newsletter where we're going to send out um, more tips and information and resources. And um, hopefully you guys will look forward to that with, um, with excitement because then it can be a step-by-step -step ongoing relationship and how you build civility um, in your world. So, um, the first question is, um, how do we have these conversations on a larger scale? So not just one-to-one, -one, but with groups or communities, um, you know, what are your recommendations for how we take that to a, a bigger plane? Well, you know, I, I do think it starts with learning to do individual conversations. And once you get comfortable there, uh, you know, uh, people are oftentimes in this, this society afraid to speak in large groups and Steve and I have seen that even in our civility sessions where people are afraid to speak up because they're afraid to be judged or oftentimes there is a huge cost for making a mistake for saying uh, the wrong thing. I think if we're going to have civil conversations on a long large scale we have to say you know we have to be willing to say look there's no there's no sanctions here there's no punishment here if you screw up, if you make a mistake, uh, we're not going to shout you down, condemn you. Uh, you know, we're gonna to try to talk you through it perhaps, but this idea that we have to be a, so guarded in our conversations always, I don't think leads to productive speech or productive you know, group talk. Yeah, I mean, I also, I also think, um, uh, uh, sort of the, 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 to take that even a step further, you know, holding yourself back mm -hmm. from from the expectation that that as an individual uh, mm -hmm. you have to solve these bigger uh, these bigger issues. 
you know, um, we were talking about the things that are going on protest wise right now uh, and how confused I think people are about a lot of those things. Um, uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense to be confused and to see the complications. Uh, but, but to give yourself a break and say, well, I, I actually can't solve that. Um, uh, and so I'm not going to expect that I can. What I can do, though, is in the community where I live, try to reach out to somebody uh, who I might disagree with or who I might have a misunderstanding with about this and try to work on that, right? That one-to-one -one interaction, I think, is what we're really talking about when we talk about civility. Um, uh, how do we relate to the people in our world? Uh, how do we connect with the people that uh, that we can connect with um, to be able to have more productive and um, and civil conversations. Um, uh, and that's, uh, you know, again, that's intentional. That's, uh, that's uh, tuning out a lot of the, the, the stuff you might see and hear about what is going on. You know, social media, I think, is one of the greatest inventions uh in in the modern world but it's also um it's also rife right now in its infancy with with uh with inappropriate and inaccurate information that that does not advance the conversation i think it's important to be able to screen a lot of that out um uh, and, and focus on what you can control what you can do um and, and civility i think uh kind of asks us uh, uh, to, again, do that pretty intentionally. So um, Jeffrey asked a really good question um, related to marketing and advertising. Um, he said, what do you see as some of the mistakes that marketers and advertisers make when trying to promote understanding, empathy, and civility in moments like we are currently experiencing? And I think um, Andy and I had talked about that a little bit in the notes that, you know, we've seen some major brands over, you know, the past few years take a stand um, or feature people taking a stand. Um, Nike comes to mind, Adidas, Amazon, there are others that have, um, have wa walked into that conversation. Are they doing it well? Are they making mistakes? Um, maybe you guys could shed some light on that. So, so I, I actually was just having a conversation about this uh, this morning um, with someone who was really frustrated with uh, with some corporate messages that we're getting here in Detroit. And, um, and sort of where I've settled on this is, I, it does not bother me for anybody to come out and say, uh, the things that we are seeing are, are reactions to, to, to great wrongs in our society. And, and we stand on the side of correcting those wrongs. I mean, I think that's that's a voice that that all of us should want to add ours to, um, and I don't know that we need to. I don't know that we need to immediately react with cynicism uh, when when it's a corporation that does it. At the same time, we should be asking some pretty important questions about those corporations when they do that. Okay, well, if you do stand uh, against these things, how willing are you to correct your own? participation in some of them. Uh, the mortgage industry, uh, the banking industry is one of them that, that is getting people worked up here in Detroit. Uh, Dan Gilbert, who's a big deal in Cleveland as well as here in Detroit, uh, is, is one of the most uh, uh, influential figures, uh, corporate and individual here in, in, in the city of Detroit. He's added his company to a, to a message about, uh, about all of this. Uh, but but how willing is he to, to really look at the role that the mortgage industry, the role that banks have played in fostering inequality, in some cases in founding inequality? Um, I, I think that is where the error is. And that's where they get in. That's where they get people uh, uh, really, really pushing back. And And it's not just a question of how do you fix those things. In a lot of cases, it's are you willing to even indulge the exploration of ways in which your company or your industry has played these these roles to to, to put us in the in the position where we are? Um, 
I would say the same thing for the industry that, that Nolan and I work in. Um, newspapers have tremendous histories uh, in inequality. There is not a newspaper in this country that was around pre-Civil War that didn't make money off of fugitive slave ads. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, uh, when he published a newspaper in, uh, in Philadelphia, often took slaves as payment in exchange for services uh, because people were money. Black people were money then. Um, uh, coming to reckon with those things, uh, even as uh, an exercise in, uh, again, uh, disclosure or exploration is super important. Coming to reckon with those things in terms of the financial damage that they might have done uh, is super important. And we're seeing some people do that. Um, I think that's the question you put to, to, to people who say, hey, I wanna be about the right thing. Well, okay, it, that goes beyond just saying it. It, it. There are things that each of us needs to be doing uh, that would contribute to that. You know, I think um, when marketers, when companies weigh in on the culture wars, deviate from product marketing to weigh in on the political and pro culture wars, they, you know, I, I agree with Steve, they better have their own houses in order, but it does, they do risk generating a lot of cynicism as well. Are you simply pandering? Are you, you know, you've got your, you know, your finger in the air saying, well, you know, this side of the market or divide uh, be more profitable for us than the other. And, you know, then they fuel, also fuel these very destructive and divisive, we're gonna boycott you and now we're gonna boycott them. I don't know often if it's as helpful as it's intended to be. So um, another question that came up that Andy and I were talking about as a potential question to explore is um, different definitions of truth nowadays. And, you know, the media definitely can play into that. Some media can. And so one question was, have you found any effective practices for facilitating civil conversations between people whose viewpoints or opinions are based on different sets of facts or different perceptions of the truth? So how do we understand truth um, when we're in this declining trust of media in general and how do we build civility if we if we define truth and fact differently well i mean everybody thinks they own the facts and they own the truth i mean nobody's out there you very few people out there saying well uh, you know my views aren't true or my views aren't factual i mean that's why you have discussions and that's why it's important to have civil discussions to sort of get at uh, uh, the truth and the evidence. And, uh, you know, it's not so much different truths, it's different perceptions of what's true. Uh, so you know, I think that goes to the I core I, of the I, issue. I, I do think that, that we have, because of social media, I don't think this is new. Um, I mean, I think there have always been people who intentionally spread misinformation as a way of trying to influence conversation in a, in a way that's that's inappropriate. Uh, social media makes that easier uh, to spread. It, it makes it more confusing uh, for consumers about, um, uh, you know, what's the difference between somebody who's saying something that's true and, and something that's false. Um, and, and, I, and I think um, in a broader sense, we still have yet to come up with a way to reckon with all that, right? Social media is a, still a very new tool um, and a very new part of our culture. And we haven't figured out what's the way to make it subject to the same scrutiny of fact or fiction that, that other methods of, of communication have, have evolved into. Uh, and, I, and so I think it's important to note that and, and, and uh, acknowledge that that's a, a fight we still need to be having. The other thing that's true uh, that's happened uh, in the last four years uh, is that, uh, you know, the person with the largest platform in the world, uh, let alone the country, uh, has, has given himself over to uh, spectacular um, uh, spreading of misinformation. I mean, just outright lying. Um, and um, whether you are for this president and his policies or against them, 
uh, I think it's important to note the, the facility with which he lies uh, and uses uh, falsehoods to advance uh, his agenda. And again, I think that's an important distinction. I don't think you have to be a Trump critic uh, from a policy standpoint to talk about the ways in which he has uh, played with the truth. The danger of that, of course, is that, again, he has that platform and it's a platform that we are supposed to reflexively uh, respect and, and revere. Um, uh, and that's another difficulty. One of the things that will happen when this presidency ends, whether that's uh, this year or in four years, uh, is that we, we have to kind of repair that part of, uh, uh, of the institution, uh, which, which really has been shredded. Uh, and I, I don't know that there's anyone who really debates that. Um, uh, the, the question is, uh, once you've breached uh, the institution in that way, how do, you, how do you put it back together? How does the next president uh, use that platform in a way that repairs what was, what was done? So um, there's, there are two questions that I want to um, combine because we're um, nearing in on the end of our hour. But one of them comes in every single session that we have, which is, you know, how do you engage um, the population in these types of conversations, especially when um, people who, quote unquote, need it the most or might be least likely to engage um, or might avoid these types of conversations. Um, and then, you know, following up on that with the question about, you um, you, you need a certain amount of willingness and open-mindedness to participate in a conversation toward building civility. And so how do we get people just to that starting point of um, being willing to listen, you know, before they engage in the conversation and, and sort of breaking down those walls, whether it's, you know, with a friend or a relative or a customer um, in some way, like how do we even get them to the point of just beginning this journey? So- Well, what, I think one, uh, one thing is to not approach it with very self-righteous uh, uh, suppositions on your own part. I mean, let's not assume that you know, you're the one who is open-minded and willing to listen, and you're the one who has all the answers. Uh, that's the first thing I think you do, is, is uh, accept that you may have your own issues and your own biases, your own prejudice, and go into it with that true spirit of, I want to converse, I want to learn. Uh, uh, so I think if you're asking the questions that way, you may have some issues on your own end you want to work in before you have, uh, you know, you're in the right place to have a productive civil conversation. I mean, uh, and sort of learn to relish the give and take rather than seeing it as this, this battle, this unpleasant uh, task you have to do, uh, you know, it's sort of fun to go back and forth and learn the fun in it, you know, and keep the anger out if you can. Uh, that's, that's what I would say. So, so I, I think no one's right about but all those things. I, I would add to that, um, that, um, you know, sometimes uh, approaching this as, um, you know, uh, away from the disputes themselves. So, so you go back to this this um, this exercise that Nolan and I did for StoryCorps, um, and that was sort of after we already had a relationship. But I think. Uh, there, there's a lesson to be drawn there about engaging other people that that if you try to engage them about something other than what you know to be the source of disagreement uh, you know you you start to build a relationship that permits uh, I think uh, both sides to be able to try to engage that way um, uh, to try to talk to one another about more difficult things because um, uh, because you've you've spent the time to to try to learn more about who that person is and why they think what they think anyway the workplace is a great place to do that I think uh, because uh, you already have a relationship with that person even if it's a, a, a tenuous one that you work together uh, you work at the same 
uh, that as the predicate for a discussion about um, you know what you think and how you think I think uh, again um, makes it more possible to have these diff these more difficult uh, conversations and to do it in a way that's not you know, bitter or confrontational. Mind the setting. I mean, there's some places where you know these conversations are 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 appropriate and welcome. Some places they're not. My the wife of my old publisher. Uh, when, it didn't matter where we are, we had a football game, and she'd want to start talking about. So, what do you think about that Trump this and Trump that, or you know what, or why are all the cheerleaders Caucasian? I'm like, I'm just sitting down here with my beer and my brat, and just getting started. You know, this is not the place. You know, find the right spot, find a comfortable spot where you know everybody's more at ease. Yeah. So let's, a football games. let's finish with um, answering um, one of the first questions that was asked, um, which I think is really important, is what can we do right now to help or to make a difference? There's so much going on. A lot of people want to show empathy or make a difference or get involved in a way that's meaningful and impactful and aren't sure what to do. So what uh, last thoughts can we leave people with about, you know, what can I do today to move us toward a place of civility? You know, check yourself and, you know, particularly in these times when there is so much division and people are viewing what's happening from so many different ways. You know, the one, the one tip I can offer, the one thing I would say is, you know, we're all find ourselves in groups where everybody thinks like we do and in groups where people don't think all the same, you know, mixed groups, if you will. Uh, check yourself. Are you saying things? in that group where everybody thinks like you that you wouldn't say in that mixed group. Uh, I mean, that's a good first step maybe. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. Yeah, I also think, um, you know, um, giving yourself permission uh, to, to think and to say the uncomfortable thing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. um, again, this is, complicated stuff and and not everybody uh, is in the same space with it and and not everybody understands everything that everybody else uh, thinks they understand we've gotta we've gotta be able to talk honestly about these things and so um, you know not holding yourself back from either the feelings or the expression I think is is um, is really important. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, really examining uh, your life for the things and the dynamics that contribute to this, um, uh, even if they're unintentional. Uh, where we live, uh, where we choose to live, where we choose to send our children uh, to school or to play, um, where we do business. Um, all of those things in our lives, all of those choices have profound implications for the problems that we're talking about. And that doesn't make any of us necessarily a bad person because we're making choices uh, that may make that worse. Uh, it, it's just that we need to be aware of it and aware of maybe the need to change the way we do some of those. Things. It's not, I think um, too often we think of these things as, as a function of things that other people are doing or not doing, and if they could just cut it out or do it, do it different, it would be fine. I actually think uh, all of us need to say, what, what role do I have in, in all of that as well? Thank you. So Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson, thank you um, for leading us on this quick civility deep dive. And Andy Hollander, thank you so much for sponsoring this session. And um, I'm going to follow up with everybody who is um, participating today with a survey. We hope that you guys will engage with us in the future. And um, maybe we can each bring a friend and start building some civility ambassadors around the world. So um, thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Look forward thank to the all. next time we can do, do this Appreciate again. It. It's been fun. Thank you. <laughs>